There we go. So um, welcome to uh, to the second part of this series, Biomechanics of Athletics. Um, this part, we're going to focus on the jumping events. Um, we're going to have a little bit of talk at first, just kind of generally some biomechanics stuff in general and about jumping in general. And then we'll have a, a section on each of the four jumps where we'll talk a little bit about some of the unique things um, about each of those events. Um, I'll start off with a real quick, I guess, um, introduction to myself and some of the concepts we're going to cover. I'll go through these fairly quick because especially some of the concepts that, that I'm going to present first are ones that were covered in the, the previous uh, installment of the series when we talked about running and sprinting, but they are relevant. So I will quickly go back over those again. Uh, I am going to hopefully now do a screen share. Let's see if we can make this work on our first attempt. And we are going to, boom, there we go. I hope, is everybody uh, everybody able to see that, I hope? I see a thumb up from Tim. Thank you, Tim, and Carol, thank you. All right, so we'll get started then. So like I said, this first part will be a little bit of a, a recap from the previous installment of this series, but um, important nonetheless. Um, I'm going to get back on my right screen here to go through the slides. Uh, I guess real quick, I, yeah, I didn't think of that. Uh, introduce myself for those who, who don't know me. My name is Steve LeBlanc, and I work for Athletics New Brunswick, and I'm also the head coach for track and for cross country at University of Moncton um, here in Moncton, New Brunswick. Um, my background is uh, started out as a biomechanist, I guess, or I guess really I started as a coach and became a biomechanist and now became a coach again. Um, so my background is in biomechanics and sports biomechanics, and my uh, my master's uh, work was on jumping in particular. So this is a, a topic that's quite uh, near and dear to me. Um, my doctoral research that I was doing uh, at uh, University of Alberta was on sprinting, but my master's work that I did at Dalhousie University was on jumping. Um, as a coach, I've certainly coached a lot of jumpers over the year, jumpers and combined event athletes, and so I come at it with a little bit of experience from that side as well. So. Uh, and actually, uh, the other little bit is what is biomechanics? Uh, most people kind of have an idea or a concept, but basically it's the application of mechanical principles to studying biological motion. And in our case, really, we're interested in human motion, although there are lots of biomechanists who study uh, animals and so on. Um, takes a, concepts from a lot of different areas of, of science and, and kind of applies it all to, to uh, human movement. Now, uh, I always say sports biomechanics are our two main concerns are either reducing injuries or improving performance. And of course, a lot of times those things go sort of hand in hand. They're kind of uh, two, two parts, two sides of the same coin, I guess. So a lot of the stuff we'll talk about in biomechanics will obviously improve performance, but often also using correct technique um, will reduce injuries. So they kind of go together. All right, uh, as I said, some of the concepts are things that we covered in the last series, but I'll quickly review um, a little bit about planes of motion because it is gonna be especially relevant when we're looking at some of the, uh, the movements that we do and particularly in high jump to look at different planes of movement. So we, we can think of the body being split into uh, uh, through a frontal plane where we divide it into a front half and a back half. We can think of a transverse plane where we're gonna split the body into a top and a bottom. And we can think of a sagittal plane in which we're going to split the body into a left and a right. So depending on the type of motions that we're looking at, um, we may be looking at movements in, in any of those planes and, and usually more than, more than one of them at the same time. Um, so why are these important? Well, it's important when we define the movement patterns of, of technique that we talk about what's going on in different planes and how we define the movements. Um, also important to think of it in terms of uh, from a coaching perspective or from a biomechanist perspective to think of how we're going to observe the skill from what points do we want to see depending on which planes uh, most of the motion is taking place and we'll determine where we want to observe it from and, and where we want to watch that skill. As I said, many skills involve movements in multiple planes and certainly we will see that in jumping, particularly in the high jump, which is a very multiplanar uh, skill. Um, going along with that, we can think of the axes of rotation, which project out of those planes. So we have an anterior posterior axis of rotation coming out of the frontal plane. We have a vertical axis projecting out of the transverse plane and a medial lateral um, axis coming through 
the sagittal plane. Um, this, again, will be a little bit of review, but we're going to add a little dimension to this. We talked in the, the, the session on sprints and running a lot about um, things going on in the linear sense of, of uh, momentum and acceleration and velocity. So momentum is the amount of motion a body has, and it's related to both its mass and its velocity, so that momentum is the product of those two things. When we talk about acceleration in the linear sense, uh, we're talking about a change in the velocity of, of a body. And there's, if a force is applied, the acceleration is going to be proportional to the mass of the body. So we covered this a little bit last uh, in the last uh, talk, and we related it to Newton's uh, second law of motion. And you see, I say here the linear motion, because what I'm going to do today, the theme of today, is going to be looking at the four jumping events from both a linear momentum perspective but also uh, from an angular momentum perspective. So these same equations and, and laws that we look at in terms of linear uh, movement also apply when we look at rotation or angular movement. So we can think of angular momentum uh, being the amount of angular motion that a body has, and it's related to its uh, moment of inertia, which is made up partly of its mass and how that mass is distributed. And we'll see how that's really critical when we look at controlling angular momentum in some of our um, jumping techniques. Um, and uh, it's also related to the angular velocity. So we can see these similar type of equations that apply in the linear system apply in the angular system. So we have those same sorts of relationships. Obviously, the, the concepts are, are slightly different, but they are similar. So angular acceleration is the change in the angular velocity of a body. And it's proportional to the net torque applied, or the moment of force, if you, if you prefer that term, applied. And... Uh, and it's and the moment of inertia, uh, which we mentioned above. So I don't expect those of you who are not into biomechanics and stuff that uh, you're not going to need to know this per se to understand the rest of the talk. But just to give you a basis of where we're going with this, we're going to break up um, the jumping uh, events and look at them from both a linear and an angular perspective, because there's a lot going on there that's that's relevant in those two two sorts of systems. Okay, so continuing with the idea of biomechanical principles that apply to all of the jumps, the first one I'm gonna talk about is projectile motion because it's really important um, to understanding how the body moves through space when we're jumping. So once the body loses contact with the ground and we, be, we become airborne, we basically become a projectile. The path that we follow is gonna be determined by what our takeoff velocity uh, is when we leave the ground to a large extent. Now, yes, there is air resistance that's going to uh, potentially change us, especially if there's headwinds and so on. Those things will affect our, our velocity to a certain extent. But if we just think of the, uh, the projectile motion without considering air resistance, it's pretty much determined by what happens when we leave the ground. What velocity we have there is going to determine our flight path. So if we imagine the body just simplified here as sort of a point mass represented by our little center of mass um, icon, and we imagine that the body takes off with a certain amount of velocity directed in a forward and upward way, we can think of that velocity being broken into two components, thinking of just the vertical components and as well as the horizontal. Now, in this case, we're only looking at those two dimensions. We're not looking at the, the medial lateral or side to side velocities, which certainly there, there are in jumping and, and, and certainly in, in high jump uh, a lot of uh, medial lateral um, forces and, and accelerations and velocities. But we'll simplify it to just think of vertical and horizontal for right now. Um, so the center of mass is going to follow a parabolic path. Once it leave, once you know we leave the ground, we become airborne. We're going to imagine that center of mass is going to travel through the air, and it's going to follow a parabolic path. Now, in the case of jumping, generally, um, the takeoff height and the landing height of that center of mass are very different, um, and that is a factor that uh, that we can look at. But if we break it into sections here, you can see from the takeoff to the high point of the jump. And then from that point on to the center of mass returning to the same height that it took off. And then there's a third section where the center of mass is still traveling forward as it drops to a lower position than it started at. So we can imagine in long jump starting uh, you know, on the board in a tall takeoff position and then landing in the sand in our heel shoot position, there's going to be a difference in the center of mass height from the, where it started when it left the ground to when it returns to the ground. 
And we can see that sort of modeled here in these sections of, uh, of the jump. And the overall distance obviously is what's really important to, to long jump is the from that takeoff point to, to where we end up in the sand. So if no external forces act to create a, a net torque uh, or uh, any other kind of uh, uh, a net force, you know, as I said, with air resistance, the body's going to maintain the angular and linear momentum that it had at takeoff. So basically what happens at takeoff is what determines what's going to happen during the flight of the jump. And there's not a lot we can do to change that um, other than, like I said, with, with wind resistance being one factor that can affect it slightly. But by and large, most of what we uh, are going to deal with, we whatever we have at takeoff is what we have to deal with then through the rest of the flight. So what else about flight? So we already mentioned that the velocity at takeoff um, affects the flight parameters, how far and how high. And the greater the velocity, obviously, the greater the distance that we're going to travel. So the greater that takeoff velocity is, the further we go. Um, and potentially the higher we go, depending on which one is our goal. The angle of projection is basically just meaning what angle of of velocity do we have so if we think of it as that one vector representing the direction that we were we were going as we left the ground what angle is that relative to say the horizontal relative to the ground um, and we can break that then into components looking at both the, uh, the horizontal and the vertical components to see how that would affect our flight parameters another one that's kind of important especially in, in uh, some of the events more so is the height of takeoff so how high was the center mass of the body um, when we left the ground um, there's a big advantage obviously in jumping events to be tall in that the center of mass is already starting at a very high height and if the person then is following through to landing say in long jump in the heel shoot position and they can land in a fairly efficient position down there they're going to have gained distance by having started so the third sort of phase of that parabolic flight that we looked at after the body has returned to the starting height and is now dropping to a lower point. If the person started at a higher height, that third phase of the jump is going to um, take longer and therefore the person will be traveling forward for a longer period of time, therefore going further. Um, the height of the takeoff is also pretty important in pole vault. We'll see uh, later on in the talk um, where that comes into a, a, be a very important factor. Um, and then the height of the landing. So as I said, if we're looking at the heel shoot position, if, uh, if the athlete can achieve a very good, efficient uh, landing position, they will maximize the distance that they've covered while they were in the air, so while they were in flight. So those are four big factors that determine how far we're going to go while we're in the air. Um, if we continue on with these uh, principles, as I mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about the angular or rotational systems involved in jumping. So if we have a force that's applied at a distance from some axis of rotation, the result is going to be that we have a net torque. Um, that torque then is going to generate angular momentum, as we saw in those equations that I put up a few slides ago. So if we have this net torque, it's going to create an angular momentum, which means the body now, while it's in the air, is going to rotate. And generally speaking, it's going to rotate around the center of mass of the body. That's going to be the point about which everything rotates. Okay. So the forces applied during a jump takeoff will tend to cause rotations around the center of mass of the person. And, and generally speaking, for most of our jumping events, that causes a rotation in a forward direction. So as you can see in the little picture there, as this jumper takes off from the ground, there's going to be a tendency for them to rotate forward in a sort of somersaulting um, axis. Um, sometimes that's a good thing, but a lot of times, especially in long jump and triple jump, that's not a good thing. So we have to find ways to either reduce this rotation or control it in some way. And we'll look at those as we look at the events. So as I said, the athlete's got to find a way to control this either to maximize uh, or basically to maximize its, uh, its use to, to, to uh, in, improve performance. So either we're trying to use that momentum in, in some way to achieve, um, say, a bar clearance or whatever, or we're trying to reduce the effects of that to achieve a better landing position, for example, in long jump or triple jump. So we'll see that we have different techniques for how we deal with that. But we have this angular momentum at takeoff, no matter what, it, it's going to be there and we have to then deal with it. And it's either a good thing and it's helping us or it's a bad thing and we need to find a way to reduce its effects 
or uh, negate it in some way. Okay, one of the ways that uh, the body is interesting in this case that we don't, we're not just a point mass, we're made up of, of, of a body that can move with body parts moving relative to each other. So the body is made up of these different parts. We can move them relative to each other and that allows us to actually control a little bit of what's going to go on. And one of the ways we can do that is using secondary axes of rotation. So the example you see here in the photo, the athlete is using a hitch kicks um, technique uh, in the flight phase of a long jump. And by rotating the arms around in a forward direction and cycling the legs through in a, in a forward rotation kind of system, what that does is it takes up the rotation that the whole body had around the center of mass of the entire body and by swinging the arms and legs around in that forward direction, it actually then reduces the effect uh, of that angular momentum of the whole body. And so by taking up the momentum that the whole body had into these secondary axes, so just parts of the body now are moving forward, the overall effect can be to reduce or in fact, even in some cases, reverse that forward rotation that we tend to have during um, a jump takeoff. And so... A lot of times, sometimes we're trying to speed up a rotation and other times we're trying to slow down a rotation. And uh, we can use these techniques to kind of help us do that. Um, I really tried, I looked all over the internet to try to find a video of, uh, I was sure there was an old black and white movie, you know, uh, Charlie Chaplin or somebody standing on the ledge of a building and starting to fall forward. And one of the things we do automatically that we don't even think about, when we start to fall forward, we start to windmill our arms in a forward direction so that we don't fall forward. And that's exactly what we're doing is creating a secondary axis of rotation. So try that sometime, just stand, don't stand on a building maybe, but stand on a curb or something or a little box or a step. And if you start to lean forward and you start to feel yourself start to fall forward, if you start to windmill your arms then in a forward direction, you take up that angular momentum that the body has into that secondary axis of rotation going through the shoulders, and you'll actually stop yourself from tipping forward. And in fact, if you do it rapidly enough, you'll make your body um, tip backwards. So I tried to find a video of that to show, but boy, I could not find it. So if anyone ever finds a video from that uh, in a movie or anything else, um, please uh, let me know because I would love to include it, but I just couldn't find a good one. Okay, another biomechanical principle that we will discuss is equal falling bodies. So as I mentioned, the body is made up of all these parts that are interconnected, but we can sometimes think of them as being separate masses. So here you see this athlete, uh, which I believe is Fiona May, um, is in this beautiful long heel shoot position. And we can imagine the overall system of her body being made up of these individual masses. So here I've just simplified it to be two legs, two arms, and her head and trunk but we could break it down into even more because obviously we could have an upper leg, lower leg that can move relative to each other. We could even have the foot moving relative to the lower leg. We could have the forearm versus the upper arm. So the head separate from the trunk. So we have a lot of body parts that we can move at these various joints. Um, when we consider the body made up of all these masses, that flight path that we talked about is the representation of all of these masses together. What's that, 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 um, some of those masses going to do? How is it going to travel? But these obviously, we can move all these body parts relative to each other as we discussed in the secondary axes. Um, and how we control these separate kind of parts of the body will affect a lot about how we control the rotations that we have as well as positioning ourselves for, for landings. So muscle forces, in, internal to the body is what we can use to move these masses relative to each other. But as I said, the overall center of mass is still going to follow that parabolic flight path <clears throat> that was determined when we left the ground. Okay. So one of the things that and I, I don't know if I've heard anyone use this term for a long time, thankfully, I'm hoping that it's disappeared like the dinosaurs, but I used to hear people talking about keeping the legs up in the heel shoot. And, and I remember coaches discussing with athletes about, you know, doing a lot of core training, strengthening up their abs so that their legs don't drop during the heel shoot. And the reality is has absolutely nothing to do with strength because all those body parts are, are falling at the same rate. So there's no strength involved with keeping your, your legs up to, to complete a heel shoot. Um, what does make your feet drop is if the upper body um, stops rotating forward in the heel shoot 
the legs are going to drop as well because the overall angular momentum of the system says that the body is going to rotate forward. So um, that's an old myth about, you know, having strong abs to keep your legs up in the finish of a heel shoot. Thankfully, I haven't heard anyone say it for years. So hopefully that has disappeared from the mythology. Uh, one of the key things, of course, is maximizing the touchdown distance or in, in the case of the vertical jumps, the clearance heights that we're trying to achieve. And we move these individual body masses around to achieve optimum either touchdown distance in the horizontal jumps or bar clearance in the vertical jumps. So how we manipulate those masses uh, is crucial to achieving those performances, either maximizing the landing distance or the clearance height. So here we can see a long jumper landing and we're trying to maximize the distance between that center of mass of the body and where the heels break the sand. Cause that's obviously what the officials are gonna measure is where those heels hit. They don't care where your center of mass is. They have no way to determine that. What they're gonna look for is where did you break the sand? So a really well executed heel shoot position will place those heels that hit the sand first way ahead of the center of mass. So gaining us distance in the landing. So that heel shoot position is a very critical part of maximizing the distance in the horizontal jumps. Obviously in, this is a great layout position, isn't it? Um, in the high jump and the pole vault, how we manipulate those, those different masses of the body helps us get the overall effect of having the hips clear the bar higher. Um, and in really effective jumping, we can actually have the center mass of the body actually go under the bar and never actually clear the bar but the body parts still make their way over. Um, there's even some great, uh, there's a, a biomechanics researcher by the name of Jesus de Pena, who is kind of the, the guy when it comes to high jump biomechanics, jumping biomechanics in, in general, but certainly high jump biomechanics. Uh, he himself was a former high jumper. Um, he has a few papers out that he's done where it's shown that using the old style of jumping the straddle, the dive straddle, is actually more effective bar clearance than the Fosbury flop technique, uh, but it's more difficult to achieve. And so there's a greater potential for success, but it's also more difficult to optimize it. So that's why we've kind of gotten to the point where the flop is what all pretty much high jumpers do. Um, but there is some research to suggest that maybe we should be rethinking that at some point and looking back at dive straddle. Anyway, that's neither here nor there right now. Um, so our next um, thing we're going to look at is the forces that are causing um, this takeoff, uh, both the creation of the vertical and horizontal velocities, as well as the rotations or the angular momentum. So if we take a look at a simple jumping takeoff, again, we consider the center mass of the whole body. We know that gravity is acting to accelerate the center of mass towards the ground. We know that there's some amount of air resistance, which is going to be acting uh, against the person, depending on the wind strength and direction. And then the other big forces that's at play is that ground reaction force, where the foot meets the ground, whether it's on a takeoff board or a high jump runway or whatever. Um, we're gonna have some force acting from the ground through the body. And of course it's equal and opposite to the force that the athlete is putting into the ground. Good old Newton's laws. If we take a look at the two components of this ground reaction force, some of it acting vertical, some of it acting horizontal. And again, we're simplifying it to just look in two dimensions rather than looking, uh, we also could be looking at the medial lateral forces, which, um, which are there, uh, but are obviously much more prominent in high jump than they are in the other three jumps. But if we take a look at that, at the ground contact as the person touches down in that jump movement, and then again, as we consider it at the tail end of that, as they're leaving the ground, we can see that the vertical components obviously are always pointing upward, but our horizontal component goes from pointing backwards as a braking, what we would call a braking force, to then pointing forwards in the direction of the jump as what we would call a propulsive force. So throughout that ground contact from when the first the foot first hits the ground to when it leaves the you know, we leave the ground on the other end of that um, takeoff, the direction of the forces is gonna change throughout that contact. And obviously the magnitudes are gonna be changing significantly during that. So what I've got here is just a, a simple ground reaction force recording from a, from a short approach jump. So this isn't 
the magnitudes here aren't ne necessarily representative of what you might see in a competitive triple jumper long jump, although they're probably not crazy different either. Um, so what we can look at here is when we push on the ground, as I said, the ground is going to push back in the opposite direction, but with the same magnitude. That's Newton's laws. And we know that we can only accelerate by pushing on the ground. So to create vertical velocity or horizontal velocity for maximizing our, our performance in the jump, we really have to do that all while we're on the ground. So the takeoff, the takeoff phase is really the most critical part of the whole thing. Uh, my athletes have heard me say many times, and, and maybe some of you on here have, have heard me say on occasion, that if you don't have a takeoff, you don't have a jump. And what that means is if you haven't made an, a good effective takeoff, there's not a lot you can do to save that and make a good jump out of it. And it doesn't matter which jump we're talking about. If you don't have the correct velocity vectors and correct angular momentum at play, when you leave the ground, you're not going to have a great performance. So it all happens during that ground contact. That's the most crucial part of the whole um, jumping movement. doesn't matter how nice you drape over the bar. If you screwed up the takeoff, uh, you don't have the correct vertical velocity to get the hip height that that draping over the bar really matters. You know, you might be able to squeak out a jump, but you're not going to have a great performance if you have a poor takeoff. So because we're only on the ground for a short period of time, the forces at play have to be fairly large. And if you look on those uh, graphs I have there, the, the one that's on the top half of the screen is looking at the anterior posterior or front front and back sort of forces. And we can see they're pretty significant. They're, they're, they're measured here in terms of body weight. So you can see that the braking force is hitting up over two times body weight in the horizontal direction. And then the bottom uh, graph is the vertical forces. And we can see that we're hitting peak forces close to four times body weight. Um, and, and really a significant period of time where we're, we're over three times body weight for most of that ground contact. So we're talking about pretty significant forces to achieve a jump. And again, this isn't even... Uh, you know, a maximum long approach jump or anything. This, this data is just from a sort of mid to short approach type jump. So we're dealing with fairly large forces and it's happening over a very short period of time, a couple of tenths of a second. As you can see on this one, we're looking around two tenths of a second. And depending on the event and depending on the, the level of the athlete, that could be shorter, it could be longer, but we're looking somewhere in that, that range. So if we take a look at kind of the phases of the, uh, the upper curve there and we relay it to what's going on in the in the lower curve the vertical forces in the anterior posterior we have little blocks where we have that first little initial phase where the force is positive which means that it's actually pushing us forward in the direction of the jump then we have a long phase of braking going on and then we have another little blip of propulsion so basically what this tells us is that during the ground contact we really don't generate much forward momentum we're losing a lot we're losing way more than we're generating. So if you take a look at that, I've done here is just sort of animate that. So the little green blips are the parts of the uh, that ground reaction force curve that are propelling us forward. And the red is basically what's slowing us down in the horizontal direction. Now that first little blip of green is really your foot actively swinging back down into the track. And we will maybe talk a little bit about that technique, uh, especially in triple jump but the importance of that active ground contact. And I think we mentioned that quite a bit in the sprint uh, and running uh, presentation last time. Then we have this big red zone of braking. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's necessary during the jump. And then we have that final little green propulsive blip on the end as we get the hips, uh, the foot passed under the hips and we're in, the foot is now behind us and we're finishing the push through on the ground. We'll get a little bit of propulsion forward. Now, relaying that, uh, relating that, sorry, to the vertical forces, we can see that we have that initial little blip of propulsion as the foot comes down and hits. Then we have this long um, sort of build of force, and it stays at a fairly high level until tailing off through that final propulsive pushes. But most of the work is done when the foot is pretty close to under the hip. And in the vertical sense, what we're doing is stopping our downward momentum because um, we have some downward momentum as we put that foot onto the board or onto the runway. We're stopping that downward momentum and generating upward momentum. So our linear momentum is going from, if we want to call it a negative direction, being downward 
to a positive direction as we leave. And, and hopefully, depending on the event, a lot of vertical, especially if it's high jump or, um, or pull volt, uh, we're trying to generate quite a bit of, of vertical um, velocity when we leave. So we need to have a lot of vertical force. All good so far? Is in, anybody get any questions so far? I feel like I'm talking kind of fast, but trying to get through all this stuff. Okay, so we're gonna start now. We've, we've talked a lot about the biomechanical concepts that are gonna form the framework for how we're gonna discuss each of the events. So that's my goal here. I'm doing pretty good. I'm a halfway into it and I'm into the second half of the presentation, so that's good. Um, so we're gonna talk about long jump first. Um, so I've managed to sneak some pictures in here of people that I've coached over the years. So this is Pierre Landry executing a, a long jump. Um, so let's talk about long jump in particular and some of the aspects of both linear and angular momentum that relate to performances. So when we look at the linear momentum of a long jump, we know that there's a, a definite relationship between how fast we come down the runway and how far we jump. We also know that there's gonna be some loss of momentum during that ground contact because we just looked at that, looking at those ground reaction forces. We know we're gonna lose momentum, which means we're losing velocity during that ground contact. If we look at the angular uh, momentum question, we know that we're gonna create uh, angular momentum during the takeoff. Again, we already looked at that in a previous slide where there's this forward rotation that happens. Um, so we need to do something to control that because if we are, tipping forward and we want to end up with our heels as far in front as possible, then that's working against us. Um, some of you may have heard or seen, and there are videos around of people using uh, a forward flip um, in the air uh, during a long jump. Um, it's against the rules now, but at one time it was, it was an option and some people experimented with it, but it was determined to be a little too dangerous um, for people to be trying because uh, you could land on your head in the, in the pit and break your neck or something. So um, you're not allowed to do a forward flip in the long jump. But that is one way, uh, rather than trying to control the angular momentum, they just went with it and used it. Um, with that not being an option, what we have to do is figure out some way to control that forward angular momentum um, to optimize our landing position. So if we take a look at the, the relationship between the velocity of the approach run and the length of the jump, it's pretty clear that there's a very strong relationship between going faster and jumping farther. So the greatest contributor by far to the jump distance in long jump is the velocity that you have as you basically hit your takeoff step. So as you hit the board, the faster you're moving forward, the further you're gonna jump. Um, for anyone who uh, has ever seen footage of, of, of long jump from world-class athletes, they're moving pretty fast when they hit the board and therefore they go far. And there's been some examples of people who are not necessarily great technicians on the long jump runway, great technicians in takeoff or in their flight mechanics who have jumped pretty far. Um, there's, there's a fairly good history, especially in the women's long jump in particular, of 100 meter runners coming over and just trying long jump and not being particularly great technicians, but being really fast, they jumped really far. Um, it is by far the most important thing uh, that contributes to the distance of the jump is how fast are you moving when you get to the board. Um, so therefore, a lot of time should be spent training the speed of the athlete, but also training the accuracy of that approach run to make sure they're not fouling all the time because they're so fast. So that's you know, those two components have to be trained quite a bit in your horizontal jumpers because um, we want the speed, but we also need the accuracy as a, of ending up on the board. But I've often said to my athletes, I would way, way rather that they are fast and behind the board than slow and on the board. You will jump much further if you're moving very fast, even if you don't hit the board, than if you slow down to make sure that you hit the board. So it's always better to be faster. <coughs> Excuse me. So we talked a little bit about that loss of velocity at takeoff, and we know that that's going to happen. That's pretty much an unavoidable thing, that we're going to lose horizontal velocity while we're on the ground. And we already mentioned that because of that braking force that goes on. The further out in front of us that foot is when we make the plant step, when we put the foot onto the board, the further in front of us it is, 
the more breaking is going to happen as a result. So if we really are trying to create a lot of vertical, like a high jumper, that foot is going to be very far out in front of the center of mass. In the long jumper, we do need to create a lot of vertical. We do need to, as a result, lose some of the horizontal velocity, but we don't want to have an excessive amount of reach in front. So we're going to watch how far out in front of the hips that foot is hitting so that we're not excessively losing horizontal velocity because we know that that's the most important thing for jump distance. Um, we also want to make sure that the foot is actively coming down and not passively waiting for the ground to come up and meet it, but actually actively swinging down to, to meet the ground. And, and that will help reduce those braking forces during the contact. So we do need to have this braking though, because that lengthens the amount of time that we're on the ground. And the reason that that's a good thing, it doesn't necessarily sound like it should be a good thing, but we need time on the ground in which to generate all that vertical force that's going to give us vertical velocity, that's going to accelerate us upwards. So creating that vertical velocity requires a longer ground contact time. And when we look at the ground contact times of high jump versus long jump, it's like double the amount of ground contact time. So because high jump is all about creating vertical velocity, we sacrifice um, a lot of horizontal velocity because we don't need it. We need very little. We do need some, but we don't need a lot of horizontal velocity to clear the bar in high jump, but we do want to generate massive vertical. So the opposite is true here in long jump where we do need vertical, but we can't sacrifice all of the horizontal. So there's this trade-off between um, the activeness of the foot contact and the position of where the foot contacts. It is going to be in front of the hips, but we don't want it to be excessively in front of the hips because that's going to end up costing us a lot of horizontal velocity. So as I said, the vertical part is really important. And so there's this trade-off that we have to optimize. Um, and every jumper is a little different in terms of what that angle is. And if you look at the research, there's quite a range of takeoff angles. But generally speaking, we're probably around 20 degrees uh, for a takeoff angle of, of that velocity vector as we leave the ground. But there's quite a bit of variation in there depending on the, the athlete, the caliber of the athlete, and, and to a certain extent, the techniques they're using. Um, but we're trying to find the optimal for that athlete. It's going to be somewhere in that range. Okay, so the techniques that we use now in, in the flight phase of long jump, we, we have quite a few different um, techniques. And, and I would say if you watch some of the modern jumpers, they tend to use a lot more what I would refer to as hybrid techniques, where they're not classically a hang jumper or classically a hitch jumper. Um, they often are using sort of hybrid or modified, sort of the mixed martial arts of, of jump techniques. It's a little bit of everything that works. But the classic models, um, this one here is what we refer to as a hang, hang style technique. And in the hang, what we're trying to do is reduce the effects of that forward rotation, that forward angular momentum we have at takeoff. And to reduce that, what we do is we stretch our mass out. So we increase the moment of inertia by taking all those segmental masses, the legs and the arms and everything, and stretching them far away from each other so they're spread over a bigger distance. So that increases the moment of inertia of the body and therefore slows down the forward velocity, the angular velocity of the body. So it's not going to tip forward as much because it's slowed down by being stretched out. And this is the classic thing you see in uh, figure skating. Um, when you see a figure skater doing a spin, they will start with their arms stretched out. They come in with a certain amount of moment, angular momentum. They have their arms out wide. They're turning very slowly. Then as they bring their arms uh, in towards the center, they will speed up their rotation quite a bit. And then when they want to leave the spin, they stretch their arms back out and it slows the rotation down. And again, same kind of thing we see in diving. Uh, if you look at high diving, um, where they're trying to enter the water without being rotating, because that will make a big splash, but yet they have to do rotations while they're in the air. So they will assume postures in the air where they're actually increasing their velocity by reducing their moment of inertia, the opposite of what the long jumper is doing in this hang technique. So that's how we control it in one way. The other classic way that we do it is using what we call the hitch kick technique, which is, as some people used to call it, the running in the air technique. So in the hitch kick, what we're using is secondary axes of rotation through the shoulders, through the hips, by rotating the arms in a forward direction and rotating the legs in a forward direction, we reduce, or in fact, in some cases, reverse the forward rotation of the trunk or of the overall body. 
And if you look at some of the footage back from the really great hitch kickers from the nineties, um, you know, guys like, uh, uh, Yvonne Pedrosa, um, you know, they were such good technicians on this. You can actually see them. And Mike Powell was so good at, you can clearly see in Mike Powell's jumps where his trunk is actually rotating backwards as he goes through the air of, of hitch kicking. So this is a very effective technique if you're jumping far. If you're not jumping far, so if you're only jumping four or five meters and you're not in the air long enough to execute big hitches, because it does take a lot of time to cycle those arms and legs around, you're probably better off sink, sticking with something simpler like a hang technique because it's it's going to be effective. You can do it in that, that amount of time in the air. You can execute the movement. Um, another technique that uh, you will see used is what we refer to as a stride jump. Um, and the stride jump is basically taking a little bit of the hang and a little bit of the hitch. So it's a little bit of a hybrid. It is a good starting mechanic for those who are eventually going to become hitch kickers because it's executing the basically the first part of the hitch kick. But it takes a little bit of that element of stretching the masses out, as you can see in this little diagram uh, here. Uh, you can see how the masses get a little stretched out, but we also do a little bit of rotating of the arms and legs in the forward direction to control. So um, this is a couple of pictures of athletes I've coached because I generally coach people to use, the starting point is to start them using a stride jump. And then depending on the athlete and what they works for them, we will either go towards full hitch kicking or we will use hang or some kind of hybrid model. But I generally start all my jumpers um, that come to me. If they're a new jumper, I start them working towards a stride technique because it's adaptable to then either become a hang or a hitch, depending on what, what works. And in some cases we just stick with the stride. I mean, Pierre Landry was uh uh, you know, jumping well over seven meters and most of his career, he generally used a stride jump. You know, we, we played around a little bit with some other techniques to, to optimize his landings, but generally we fell back to the stride jump being what worked best for him. So, you know, there are lots. And as I said, if you watch uh, footage from, from any world-class competition these days, especially the men, you'll see a lot of different hybrids of, of technique going on. So there's more than one way to control that angular momentum in the long jump. Okay, another one of my former athletes, there's Sarah Miller uh, in the triple jump. So we're gonna look at triple jump next. Any questions on long jump? Are we good? Haven't seen uh, any hands go up or anything. Um, so I hope we're still good. So we're gonna go into triple jump now. Um, again, we'll approach it from this idea of looking at linear and angular momentum uh, questions. So again, the effect of the approach run velocity in triple jump is pretty much the exact same relationship we saw in long jump the correlation is still super, super high between how fast you run and how far you go. Um, the same relationship between loss of momentum during those ground contacts, and it becomes more obvious in the triple jump, obviously, because we have three contacts in which we are losing momentum. Um, so it's more of an issue for the triple jumper even than the long jumper. And the controlling of vertical velocity becomes very important because in the triple jump, we don't want to have an excessive amount of vertical velocity because it makes the landings very hard. Um, so we don't want a huge amount of vertical velocity, particularly in the first phase in the hop takeoff. We don't want to generate a lot of vertical because it's hard to handle that on the landing of that phase. Um, so we'll look a little bit at that. Uh, in terms of angular momentum, again, because we're tripling the problem we had in long jump, we have three ground contacts in which we're going to create this forward angular momentum. Um, so that becomes an even bigger problem, a bigger issue for the, uh, the triple jumper to handle. Um, so we need to be able to control that. We also have some side to side that happens, um, uh, angular momentum that happens during those, those contacts. So there tends to be a little bit of a, a control for that tipping side to side um, that can happen in those, in those three ground contacts. And then obviously the same problem as we had for long jump is optimizing the landing position to maximize the distance into the pit for the, for the measurement of the jump. So uh, in relation to changes in velocity, this is some, uh, some data that I, I <laughs> flat out stole from, from a little paper I found online, but it, it gave a nice example of what happens. So if you look at the, the graph here, what we have is three different ground contacts. And the blue line uh, at the top represents the horizontal velocity of the center of mass during those three phases, the hop, step, and jump. And the pink represents the vertical velocities during those ground contacts. 
Um, so it's not showing the flight phases in the middle of all that. It's just showing what's going on in those three separate ground contact phases. So we can see in the horizontal, the blue line, that throughout each of those ground contacts, we lose um, some horizontal velocity. And therefore, each phase is starting with less velocity than the one before it. And it leaves, we leave the ground with even less. So it's a constant case of losing velocity. The most precious thing we want is that horizontal velocity. And yet we, as a result, lose it on each ground contact. So we try to lose as little as possible. But at the same time, there is, again, that trade-off that we do want to generate some vertical. Um, and you can see there in the... Uh, the uh, pink curves at the bottom, uh, those are the vertical velocities of the center of mass through each of the, uh, the contacts through the hop, step, and jump takeoffs. And you can see that the vertical velocity in the jump phase is actually the, the greatest, which makes sense. Because in the hop and the step phases, we're trying to maximize distance without getting too much vertical because it's hard for the athlete to control those landings if we have too much vertical velocity. I think we've all seen the young athlete who tries to triple jump the first time and goes a mile high on the hop phase and then is crushed when they hit the ground and can't execute a proper step phase because it's just too much vertical force required to stop that vertical velocity. So here we see that the third phase, the jump phase, is the one that has the highest um, vertical velocity at takeoff, um, which makes total sense um, because that's the one we're trying to generate the most vertical to set up our landing into the pit. But we're trying in that first two phases, trying to more get a little bit of vertical, but not uh, a ton because we don't want to sacrifice all that horizontal velocity either. So horizontal velocity is lost during each ground contact. Vertical is gained during each contact. And since greater jump distances are related to uh, higher horizontal velocity, it's important that we try to reduce the braking and maintain as much of that horizontal velocity as we can through each contact while still creating the vertical that we need to execute the, the jumps, the phases of the, of the jump. So controlling those velocities is critical in, in triple jump. And that's probably one of the biggest technical challenges for the athlete and the coach in triple jump is figuring out how to portion out the effort across the three phases to maximize. And there's certainly lots of different models that have been used. Um, different techniques, if you will, on how to put together those three phases. So there were people who used very, um, very much a, a hop based approach where they would do a really big hop and then sort of not so much on the step and the jump. Um, there were those who used very big jump phases. So kept the a real focus on maintaining velocity through the hop and the step, and then went for a really big jump on the third phase. Um, the one that's probably been the most dominant or most successful is actually more of a balanced approach where um, we don't overemphasize any of the phases and we sort of keep it more in the sort of 35% for the first phase, 30 for the second and 35 for the third, sort of a more balanced. Whereas some techniques used early on might see as much as 40% used on either the hop or the jump phase. But usually a much more balanced approach seems to be much more effective. Um, so that's the big thing in, in triple jump is kind of keeping that rhythm and keeping control of, of the forces at play. So we got a little photo sequence here of a triple jumper and we can just see the classic positions that the athlete achieves through the flight phases as well as how they're hitting the ground on each of those from the hop, step and jump takeoffs. Um, extreme positions, extreme forces. So it's a very hard event on the body. Um, it can produce a lot of wear and tear, especially if your technique is not great. If you're able to um, have really good, effective, active landings and get the foot positioned in a way that you're able to handle the forces, um, not only will you jump better, but you will also be less injured. And so we can, we can all imagine, I'm sure we've all seen people who are not particularly proficient triple jumpers, and it's almost painful to watch versus someone who is an excellent triple jumper and it's just magical to watch because it's just so um, easy looking. You know, it looks almost effortless when they're just like a stone skipping across the water. So um, definitely we all have seen those. So if we think of the three phases, the hop and the step and the jump, we have different missions, I guess, for each of those takeoffs. So the first one, when we look at the hop takeoff, really it's a lot about maintaining that horizontal velocity. 
we don't want to sacrifice that on the first phase because then we're going to have less and less of it on the on the second and third, right? So that first phase, we really want to maintain horizontal velocity. Oh, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to click that yet. Whoop. Um, on the step phase, we're trying to generate some vertical velocity. Um, the step phase is a really critical one. It's the shortest of the three phases typically, but it's also the one that chains the other two together. And if we're if we're going to do that well, we also have to really focus on generating a lot of vertical um, through that step phase takeoff, while again, not sacrificing a whole lot. So it's a very active plant um, and uh, the foot is very much under and a lot of knee drive in it, um, but that's a really critical link between the first and third phases is to nail that step really well. And then obviously in the jump phase, it's all about generating as much vertical as you can. You, you sacrifice a fair amount of the horizontal um, just to try to get that vertical to get the time in the air. And again, because you're going into a heel shoot and the center of mass is landing at a lower position, you can sacrifice a little bit and gain on the other end uh, if you have an efficient landing position. Okay. Um, I do have some, if we have time, I might come back to showing the video of the triple jump, but I'm going to go right into high jump. There's Steph Duara, our provincial record holder for the women's high jump, uh, one of my former athletes. And when we talk about high jump again, we can talk about the linear and the angular. And in this case, the angular becomes really critical, obviously. Um, so we'll look at the, the linear uh, momentum question in terms of that curvilinear or curved um, type approach run, and also how we're gonna deal with converting the horizontal to vertical velocity. Um, the angular momentum is a critical one, and I've, I've got a couple of good videos here I want to show you of, of how important that is, and um, the creation and controlling of that angular momentum is really what high jump is, is a lot about. So the curved approach run, if we take a look um, at a typical sort of J-shaped or curved approach run, we have that first section of the run, which is straight, before we enter uh, the section where we're going to curve uh, our run towards the bar. and this is a really crucial part of the whole um, flop style of high jump. Um, nailing this approach run is critical to being a good flop jumper. There's a lot going on in it and requires a lot of rehearsal. But basically the curve approach run, the purpose of it is to create angular momentum at takeoff. So it's just like if you watch a figure skater going in to do a jump, they don't go straight into the jump. They're curving their way before they do their takeoff because that curve allows them to swing a body part around and create angular momentum at the takeoff, which is important for them. And it's important for the high jumper to have that angular momentum to clear the bar properly. So definitely the curved approach is important to allow us to get rotations going on along the long axis of the body to get our back turned to the bar to do the flop technique. Um, so the curved approach one sets that up. So we we need a small amount of angular velocity to do that. We don't need to have a huge amount because we're only turning, you know, about 90 degrees uh, while we're in the air. So it's not a huge amount needed, but that curved approach run provides us the opportunity to basically create that. Um, the focus for the jumper there really has to be on jumping up and letting themselves turn while they're in the air around the long axis before then going into their layout. Um, and if you think of it in terms of, again, going back to moment of inertia and how we spread our mass out, if the jumper is breaking at the waist and throwing their, their shoulders towards the bar, and basically what they're doing is increasing the moment of inertia and slowing down their rotation. So they're actually making it harder for them to get their back towards the bar than if they just jumped up vertically and turned in the air, and allowing that momentum that they created in the curved approach run to let them turn and they will much easier get their back to the bar. And they will also jump higher. So that's my cue there is up and turn. So let the athlete get the idea of creating a lot of vertical at the takeoff and allowing themselves to turn in the air around the long axis using the angular momentum they created from that curved approach run. Uh, we need to control the horizontal velocities uh, of the jump a little bit, obviously, because um, we need some velocity to get from one side of the bar to the other and land on the mat. Um, we don't want an excessive amount going along the bar because we don't want to end up cracking into the standard on the far end, which I have seen athletes do on occasion. Um, none of mine, thankfully, but I have seen it happen. Um, so we, we kind of need to control those 
those, uh, those velocity vectors that are carrying us along the bar, sort of traveling the length of the bar, and those that are um, allowing us to cross the plane of the bar. So we do need some velocity to do that. Now, the other thing that sometimes jumpers will do, high jumpers will do, is they will jump sideways um, towards the mat, thinking they, if they don't do that, they won't land on the mat. But the reality is, again, because of the shape of the approach run, when they get to the takeoff point, they will already have velocity of their center mass that carries them into the mat. So they don't need to create that in the takeoff. It is, again, a result of the approach run. So they really just need to focus on jumping up. They don't need to jump sideways, which again, a lot of them beginning jumpers tend to do that because they're trying to get onto the mat. But if they just focus on doing that approach run correctly and taking off vertically, they will have a horizontal velocity that carries them into the mat. So they don't need to create that, right? That comes from the approach run. And again, there is gonna be some, some velocity because of the shape of the run that's gonna carry them along the length of the bar. And that's fine. It doesn't help us or hinder us per se, other than if we have a lot of it, we could end up traveling too far along and maybe cracking our foot into the standard and knocking the bar off or whatever. So, and I have seen it happen. It doesn't happen frequently, but it, it can happen if there's too much of that. One of the times you will see a lot of travel along the bars when the person hasn't achieved the right finish angle. And here you can see we're indicating an angle of around 30 degrees. And again, depending on the athlete and the, the you know technique and so on, it's going to be somewhere in that, but you can see how we're not finishing our approach run parallel to the bar. We're at a slight angle to it in about 30 degrees between the direction we're traveling and our foot is planting and, and the line of the bar. And again, really crucial that we, we are kind of in that range. I often will cue my athletes to think about finishing their approach run so that they're finishing towards the back corner of the mat, which sort of puts them in that 30 degree ish um, range. And then I get them to target jumping towards the top of the opposite standard, not trying to jump onto the mat, not trying to jump over the bar, but jumping up to the top of the standard that's, that's there in front of them. Because if they already have velocity vector that will carry them into the mat, they don't need to jump to the mat or towards the bar. If anything, they need to jump away from the bar. And we'll look at, uh, at a video that shows why that's important. So the challenges of the curved approach run are a lot. <laughs> There's a lot that makes it difficult. There's a lot of movement variability as a result of it being a essentially a two-dimensional approach run as opposed to long jump, triple jump, and pole vault, which I consider one-dimensional approach runs. You're just going in a straight line down the runway. The nature of the curved approach in high jump means that we're dealing with a lot of movement variability because of the two dimensions that we're moving through there. Um, so the steering of our body from the starting point through the turn mark and to our takeoff point requires a lot of skill and therefore requires a lot of practice. And I think one of the mistakes that young athletes make and sometimes that coaches make is spending too much time worrying about clearing the bar. So they'll do a lot of backovers and they'll do a lot of jumps from boxes to, you know, do the bar clear stuff. And I'm not saying not to do that. You absolutely have to. But what they tend to forget is that the approach run requires at least, if not more, practice than the actual jumping. Because it's a really difficult skill to end up in the right place at the right speed. Um, the direction of the velocity at touchdown on that takeoff uh, is important. It has to be directed at that 30 degree angle relative to the bar um, so that we have the right velocity vectors to clear the bar. Um, Obviously the position that we are relative to the bar at touchdown, we don't want to be too close to it and hitting the bar going up through it. We don't want to be too far away from it and, and, and landing on the bar coming down. We want to be in an optimal place where we're hitting our peak height right over top of the bar. And that requires a lot of skill and a lot of practice to get to the point where you're taking off from the right place. And also being able to make the adjustment as the bar height goes up, that takeoff position has to change as well. So you have to back the runway up to accommodate for that higher and higher bar. That takes, again, a lot of skill and therefore a lot of practice. And I don't think a lot of coaches spend enough time with athletes just working on the approach run. Um, it's one of the things that uh, I came to coaching high jump kind of late in my coaching career when I was at University of Alberta. I kind of got put into the role of, of working with the high jumpers. And up to that point in my life, I had generally tried to avoid it for the most part, because I wasn't a high jumper by any stretch when I was an athlete. So I wasn't sure I understood it. But once you think about it, you can break it down biomechanically. There's certain key things you need to do. And uh, that approach run is critical because it's a difficult skill. 
Okay, uh, the other part that's challenging is ending up not only in the right place with the right velocity and going in the right direction, but having your body orientated in space the right way. Uh, so not too upright, it's got to be leaned a certain way, and there's a lot of you know, elements to uh, then being in the right place, in the right direction, at the right speed, <laughs> and pointed the right way. So it's a very complicated thing to end up in the right takeoff point for a high jump. Um, the other problem with the, um, the, the high jump has versus um, the other three jumps is there's a little more environmental variability with how the high jump area is set up. So they all have to deal with different surfaces and, and certainly uh, you know you have fast and slow surfaces that we jump on and that affects all four of the jumps. Um, it, it affects the high jump more so because again of the two-dimensional aspect of it. If, if it slows you down or speeds you up, you're going to miss your check marks and you're not going to end up in the right place. In some cases, uh, because of the way that high jump runways, depending on the layout of the stadium work, sometimes you're crossing the track to, to start your runway. You're starting out on the track and then going down onto the, 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 uh, the D on the infield. Um, I can remember a case, uh, and Yvonne was there with me. I don't know if you remember Yvonne. Uh, when we were in Cote d'Ivoire, the height of the track and the height of the D on the infield, there was a slight drop, and I think it was due to the drainage system of the stadium, but there was a little bit of a subtle drop between the track and the D area. And in a couple of the jumpers that, uh, that we had there um, were kind of landing, one of their steps was landing right in that sort of area. And so it was a potential problem that they were going to kind of get thrown off balance a little bit by. So there's weird things like that that happen to high jump that tends to not to happen to, uh, to the other jumps, or at least as much. Um, the layout of the high jump fan area and, and how to set your approach marks can be very problematic. Again, for the other three jumps, it's a straight line. You stretch the tape measure back, measure out your runway, and away you go, and then make adjustments. But the high jump can be very tricky when you're trying to create right angles to set up a triangle to find the right turning point for your run and the start start mark for your run. Um, I won't get too far into the anecdote, but I can tell you that I used to really struggle with some of my jumpers when I was in Alberta. We would go down and compete in Calgary and the uh, high jump area at the track in Calgary didn't have very good reference marks to figure out whether or not you were at right angles to the high jump mat or not. And it was very deceptive in just not having good landmarking and not a lot of lines on the track on the uh, area to orient yourself. And so I ended up having jumpers have real difficulties in finding their takeoff points there just because of the oddities. And um, we had to start using tape measures to set out our triangles instead of relying on sort of visual lines and stuff. So it took a little longer and more complicated to get our check marks set out there than other places. So things like that can really complicate it. Um, oftentimes we're using the background to sort of set the eyes on a certain target to make the shape of the approach run. And again, depending on where you are, it's indoors or outdoors, you may or may not have consistent background markings, uh, things for landmarking, even the types of, of standards, uh, the type and height of the standards uh, can vary quite a bit from location to location. And if you're using that as part of your, your keying of your, the shape of your approach run, that can throw you off a little bit. So there's a bit more variability in those things uh, related to high jump than there is for the other jumps. And it just makes it trickier. And again, goes back to the idea that you need to rehearse the approach runs a lot more, I think, for high jump. Um, I like this picture. I just want to throw it in real quick just to get you thinking about the curved part of the run. And you can see the, the, the figure on the left uh, has a nice line through the body where they're leaning basically from the ankle. And we're creating a nice lean towards the inside of, of the, uh, the curve that they're running. Whereas the, ath the, the athlete, the figure on the right, is sort of broken at the hip a little bit. So their upper body is leaning into the turn, but their hips and legs are in a very upright. And so that's not at all what we want. We want what's on the left. We want that person truly leaning rather than just leaning part of their body. We want their whole body leaning and creating that, that, uh, that position through the curve. Um, again, it's one of those things that young or inexperienced jumpers will tend to often fall to the position on the right there rather than the one on the left which, that we really want. Um, so it does require, again, a lot of practice to make sure the person is hitting those positions in the approach run. Um, some key elements to consider. Um, the velocity in the turn leads to more lean, which results in a better touchdown and takeoff position. So we do want to speed up around that turn. 
Is it a flat out sprint? No, definitely not. We don't want the person going so fast they can't control it. But the faster that they can run and control that turn, the better body lean it creates. And so that's what we really want. We want to create that body lean. And you'll see why in a, in a minute. I have a video, I think, that will highlight that. Um, the correct approach and takeoff, if you do the approach run well, and you it makes everything else so much easier. If you do the correct approach run and you have a good takeoff mechanic, clearing the bar is almost an afterthought. It's going to happen. So I've got a video here. I'm going to try to hopefully share it. So let's see if this is going to work. I got so many little screens open here. Um, so I just got to get to the right one to get us. Okay, so I get the right video up. Is that the one I want? I want this one right here. Okay, so I'm going to try now to share a different screen with you. Um, this is always trickier than I want it to be when I'm trying to figure out which window I have to be in. <laughs> let's maybe, let's, es let's escape from that guy for a second. Um, and let's see if I can now share the screen that I want to share, which is this one here. There we go. Okay, so hopefully what you see is Derek Druin's legs right now is what you should see. Is that uh, somebody give me a thumbs up or something if that's what you see is Derek Druin's legs? There we go. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, so I'm going to roll this video. This is, uh, this is as you can probably see, it's from the Pan Am Games in 2015, um, the men's high jump final. And I'm just going to roll it for a minute or two for you to watch Derek Druin jump. I feel, and maybe I'm biased on this because uh, I love the guy, but he is the model for me of if you execute a really smooth, good approach run and, an, and a good takeoff, Clearing the bar is almost an afterthought because it's inevitable that you're going to clear the bar if you do these things well. So let's watch this video. Hopefully this is playing okay. Is it playing at a good speed for you guys? Hopefully. Yep, thumbs up. Thank Tim. So here's uh, Derek getting ready to jump. I can't even remember what the bar height is here on this particular um, attempt, but really just watch how smooth he is through his approach run. He uses kind of the bounding in steps and then he accelerates through his turn with a nice smooth acceleration. And it just looks like the easiest thing in the world to clear that bar. And it's because he has such a good approach run that sets up a really good takeoff. And there's almost no effort to clear the bar. There's not a lot that has to be done for him to clear that bar. It really comes down to just a really nice smooth takeoff mechanic and that takeoff position comes from the beauty of that approach run. So we're going to watch one more. This is a different jump, I think, but we'll watch through it one more time. But again, just watch. Uh, you know, I'm not always crazy about the boundy steps in the start of the approach run. It's not what I coach, but I don't mind it because once he hits his turn mark, watch how smoothly he accelerates the turn. It's a very smooth acceleration. Um, it's got a great building rhythm to it that leads to his takeoff. And then the takeoff is just executed so beautifully. And he just sails over the bar in a way that's, um, like I said, you almost, you know, there's almost nothing required to clear that, right? Fantastic. I just love, that's a great, I think a great, um, a great video showing uh, how easy it is, I guess, to clear a bar. Um, all right, so, oh, actually, before I, uh, I might as well just go right. So the next the next video I'm going to show you, I might as well go right to it. Um, yes, okay. So hopefully on your screen now, uh, hopefully on your screen now, you should be seeing, uh, I think that's Stefan Holm. Yes, it is, Stefan Holm. Um, is everybody seeing that okay? Have I got the right, sharing the right screen? Maybe. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to play this video and I'm not going to play the, uh, I've got the audio turned off because it's not even in, it's in, I think it's in German or something um, that the audio is. What I'm going to show you is a video. Uh, if, if you've never seen this, uh, I, I had to go searching to find it. I had to get some help on the internet for people to help me find it because I had seen it years ago. I'd seen a couple of different versions of it. 
This uh, biomechanics researcher, biomechanics professor is going to show you how a crossbar can jump over a crossbar. Okay, so everybody ready, watch carefully. This is magic to me. So hopefully we're gonna get this to play right. Okay, so here he is, he's got a cut down crossbar. He's got a little bit of a weight uh, kind of on the top of it, but basically that's all it is is just a crossbar. And he's gonna show you how easy it is to high jump. Is that not incredible? So given the correct linear momentum, he projects it forward and down there. And then when the end hits the ground, it creates rotation, right? As a result of hitting the ground, it rotates over the bar. And there you go. That's how easy it is to high jump. A stick can do it, right? So then when you relate that, and here in the video they relate, you can see the stick sort of hovering in the air there. And you see Stefan Holm come in, and he is becoming the stick. He hits the ground at the right body orientation with the right velocity. It creates angular momentum, which he uses then to rotate over the bar. Fantastic, right? Unbelievable, great. I've, I've actually done that demonstration in person. I never videoed myself doing it. So uh, unfortunately, I guess, um, but it's just a cool, cool thing to see that how easy it is a stick literally cleared uh you know literally cleared a crossbar so i just think that's an awesome video um there's the link for it if you're really curious to watch it again um but what a cool demonstration of how important angular momentum is in the high jump so the goal at takeoff should be to stay away from the bar as i mentioned we don't want the athlete jumping into the bar we already have velocity that's carrying them into the bar if anything we want them to try to keep away from the bar and uh, and be directing themselves to kind of jump to try almost as if they're trying not to land on the mat um timing of the movements obviously of the the body parts is critical in the bar clearance so again not that it's not important you do need to practice it it is a skill that needs to be rehearsed but having said that you can see how much easier that job becomes if you've done a good job of of, of the approach run and a good job of the takeoff, everything else is then a much simpler thing to deal with. And you don't have to do a lot of work to clear the bar. You just have to have a little bit of timing of how things drape over. But if you have that hip height, if you've got the height, and I've said to my athletes many times, one of my expressions is always that they don't call it the bar jump, they call it the high jump. Jumping high is the critical part there. Um, clearing the bar, you can work on and it comes, but if you're not jumping high, there's not much you can do to clear the bar. So remember that it's called the high jump and not the bar jump. One thing I want to touch on real quick, and I don't want to get it because this could be a whole hour long discussion um, of just this topic, but the question of the speed jumper versus the power jumper. And um, if you're not familiar with the terminology, what we're referring to is there are some athletes who, who use a lot of speed in their approach run uh, to generate that vertical takeoff. And there are some who come in a lot slower and generate a lot more in the actual takeoff step. Um, and that would be your power jumper. And I've certainly had athletes who were both. I've had one, you know, I've had some that were speed jumpers, some that were power. I've even had, and I would say Steph was one who thought she was a power jumper until I convinced her she was a speed jumper. And that's when she really had some breakthroughs in her jumping was when she realized that she was actually more of a speed jumper. And that was a technique that, uh, that helped her achieve, you know, a much greater heights, obviously. Um, so it's good to sort out with your athlete. And I had other jumpers that were definitely power jumpers. Um, and so it's good to kind of figure out which one they are and which model of, of, of the, the, uh, the jump you're going to use. Um, but like I said, that's a whole, that could be a whole discussion of itself. And as I said, it's called the high jump, not the bar jump. Okay, so we're going to move on. Speaking of bars, I'm a little bit, I'm definitely over time from what I wanted to be, but we'll get through pole vault here reasonably quickly. Um, maybe maybe not doing it enough service, but we'll we'll go through it as quickly as again. That was Mitch Quigg, by the way, um, featured on that slide. So again, the question of linear momentum and angular momentum come into play. The same things in terms of the approach velocity. One big difference for the approach velocity in pole vault is that the faster you run, the higher on the pole you can hold or the longer the pole that you can you can jump on, which obviously helps your vaulting. So the approach run is even more important, uh, the linear velocity there for pole vault. Um, the timing of the pole and the, the pole plant and the takeoff 
Um, you'll see references to people talking about a free takeoff. And again, it's a whole discussion that we really don't have time for tonight to get into, but I think ideally most pole vault coaches would be looking for someone to generally have a little bit of a pre jump, if you will, that they're starting to take off before the, the, the pole is fully in the back of the box or at least very closely timed. So that the pole is hitting the back of the box around the same time they're jumping. Um, what you don't want to have is the pole hit the back of the box and then have a delay before the jumping action takes place. Cause it's very jarring and it doesn't usually lead to a very good uh, jump. Uh, obviously the vertical velocity at takeoff is critical because we're trying to jump the pole up to vertical. Um, which is what I said there, jumping the pole to vertical, and also the conversion of horizontal velocity into the potential energy in the pole. So the faster I run, the more I'm going to flex that pole, which then is going to, when it recoils, is going to give me that much more vertical velocity, which is the whole goal of pole vault, is to get that recoil out of the pole and time it well to, to get it. Now, um, the angular momentum question, part of it is that loading and unloading the pole. Um, and certainly controlling the total body angular momentum during the jump. And we'll take a real quick look at that in some photo sequences about what, uh, what we want to do when we're swinging on the pole. So if we take a look at the takeoff mechanic, really a lot is similar with the pole vault and the long jump in terms of how the approach run is done and the key parts. There's a lot of similarities there. Um, so in the, in the, uh, the approach run, as I mentioned, the faster you run, the higher on the pole you can hold or the longer the pole you can use, which is obviously either one of those things is the name of the game. Um, being in that really tall position and hitting that is important to create good pole angle. So again, the taller the athlete, the greater that pole angle is gonna be. And certainly if they're in the position like this guy is, or he's got the hand way up over it. And I actually think this is, might be a really old picture of Bupka, I think. Anyway, very young picture of Bupka. Um, the higher that starting angle of the pole is, the easier it is to get the pole to vertical and so on. So, uh, and also the more energy you can store in the pole. If it's too flat of the angle, you're not gonna, there's gonna be um, not as much energy put into the pole to, to bend it. So we want a good pole angle there. Uh, and you can see the height of that hand is really critical to have that hand up high to create good pole angle. And then the goal at the takeoff for the jumper should be to jump vertically and sometimes pole vaulters will leave too much work to be done by the pole and forget that they are an active participant in this they're not just along for the ride once the pole hits the ground you're not just along for the ride you got to do some work and part of that is in that takeoff creating as much vertical as you can to try to get that pole put you know up to vertical so we take a look at the swing phase uh in the vault um at the initial part of the swing, as we're leaving the ground, we have this really long position um, as we're kind of swinging off the, the pole. And we've got this velocity that's directing us sort of forward and upward. And we've got this force of the pole uh, where the pole and the hand meet, where the hand is pushing on the pole and the pole is pushing on the hand. And what we have now is a place where we can have rotation. So we have a force acting on that top hand and the bottom hand for that matter, but definitely on the top hand, a lot of force that's gonna create angular momentum around the center of mass. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna have this angular momentum that's rocking the person kind of backwards, if you will, sort of a backward somersault. And that's what we want. So that long takeoff position is critical so that the hand where the force of the pole is delivered is as far away as possible from the center of mass so that we have this long moment arm to create a torque that's going to give us angular momentum to create a swing. So then as we take a look over the next picture, we're now in the swing phase and we see the person shortening up. The athlete is shortening up that position. So they started in this really long position, but now they're in a much shorter position. And what they're doing is reducing the moment of inertia by moving their mass towards the middle which then increases the angular velocity. So they're going to swing faster by being in that, that little shortened, more shortened position. And that's important because we want them to swing up around to get vertically up the pole. So again, they're controlling this by reducing their moment of inertia by kind of tucking at the, the hips and the knees. That shortens the moment of inertia and increases the effect of the angular momentum they created in that initial takeoff to give them the velocity to swing their hips up through and ideally 
get their hips to be ending up above their shoulders. As you can see in that next picture, the hips have cleared the shoulders. They're now higher than the shoulders as the person is trying to get up the pole and they're trying to stay real close to the pole as they go up because what we want to have, now the pole is recoiling and it's pushing our hand upwards and lifting us. What we want to make sure is that we aren't taking energy back out of the pole by being too far away and, and having our body mass dragging the pole down in opposition to the recoil of the pole trying to push us up. And so by staying real close to the pole at this point, the pole is able to recoil and accelerate us upward and it's not being slowed down by our mass being too far away from, um, from where we're interacting with the pole with our hand. And so being close to the pole is really important at that part of the vault so that we can get the recoil driving us upward and we're not slowing that recoil down by being too far away from, um, from where we're contacting. Okay, then we get to the clearance, and this is real simple in the pole vault, really, because it's just about now we've got angular momentum, and we're just going to use that to sort of drape over the bar. Uh, we want to maximize the vertical velocity as we push off from the pole, and you can see there's a great picture there of that top hand doing the final push off the pole to get that last bit of vertical velocity. We want to optimize the angular velocity that's going on because we don't want to rotate too quickly and, and spin our legs down into the crossbar. Um, but there is, but we do want to have some rotation going on so that as we end up in the second picture, we're timing that hinging effect of sort of bending at the waist a little bit and having our legs draped on one side and our arms draped on the other, uh, a little bit like a reverse of the old straddle, dive straddle, high jump technique. Um, but basically we're timing that hinging movement and then we open back up on the other side and utilize that angular momentum that we have to rotate us so that we'd start falling and landing on our back as we come down. So we've basically rotated much like that crossbar did in that high jump uh, video. Uh, we've rotated over the bar and now we're spinning down to land on our back in the mat. So um, I do want to show you real quick um, this video. Now I got to try to do all this again. Um, <laughs> I'm going to stop that share and we're going to go back over to my video window and i've got a video here of armand duplanty mondo as we call him and this is a jump from 2019 it's a six meter jump and i want to, it's a slow motion video and i just want you to watch for all the elements we just talked about in terms of linear momentum and angular momentum as uh, we go through so hopefully on your screen now is uh, a video that's going to be of our good friend mondo um, who I will suggest, by the way, is as much as people know, he's, uh, you know, he's, he competes for Sweden, but he grew up in the U S cause his dad is American. It turns out his dad is actually a Cajun, which I think makes him a Maritimer. Argue me on that. Anyway, so here's a video of Mondo, uh, in slow motion, clearing six meters and just kind of watch for, um, those aspects that we've just talked about in terms of linear. So he's coming in with a lot of linear velocity, a lot of linear momentum, there's that long swing, and then he tucks in, gets the hips clear of the shoulder, stays tight to the pole, maximizes on the recoil from the pole, and then thrusts off and times that hinging and the rotation over the bar just beautifully. So kind of a thing of beauty to watch great pole vaulting, isn't it? It's just like an, it's like an art form. Look at that. So well-timed and just maximizing on all those aspects, control, creating angular momentum, controlling that angular momentum, timing it out. Um, obviously does a great job um, of creating linear momentum down the runway, you know, super fast runway, um, jumps the pole to vertical beautifully and just, you know, incredible. So that's, that's our pole vault. Um, all right, now. See if I can see if I can get back on the right screen again. Uh, who knows? Maybe I will. Okay, so that is jumping pile mechanics in a nutshell. And I'm way over time. I apologize. That went on longer than I really wanted it to. But there was just so much stuff to talk about. Thank you to those who have stuck it out to the end. 
I would really love to get some questions or comments or some discussion around any of this stuff. I know there's a ton of stuff that we really didn't even get into because it's just so jumping is so interesting. There's so much stuff to talk about. Um, so do we have some questions or some stuff that you'd like me to backtrack to or? I've got a quick question if. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with long jumping uh, and flight techniques, mm -hmm. um, I've got an athlete who uses a hang technique mm -hmm. and I'm just I'm just wondering about uh, on takeoff and sort of maximizing the or utilizing the benefit of blocking mm -hmm. uh, the the free leg and 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 the arms, um, but it, you know it it appears that more that technique is more right to vertical to and and it's more to control the angular momentum. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Is, but is it, is it, uh, is it possible to, to be able to utilize the benefit or, 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 or use the benefit of, of blocking? Um, not really, I guess. Uh, ah. Do you mean blocking in the sense of at the takeoff or as blocking the limbs when you're in flight? When you are leaving the board uh, and you're, you're blocking to try and get that, forward momentum with your with your limbs essentially the 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 free leg and 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 the arms right 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 and um it, it kind of comes down to um really what you're doing is playing with the angular momentums um it's more so than the than the linear uh, velocities or linear momentum and so that sort of driving the knee and, and blocking it really doesn't have a huge effect on creating any more linear velocity. What you do want to do is be driving that knee up through the takeoff so that we're accelerating that center of mass up and forward, um, potentially improving the ground reaction forces that, um, uh, that are acting um, at, during the takeoff. Once we've left the ground um, in, the, in the hang style, what we are trying to do is just hit to a really big stretched out position. Yeah. Um, so when you do, uh, drive the arms up high off takeoff, or at least one of the arms, you're then going to stretch the other arm up to get them stretched out as much as you can. That knee block that happens on, on takeoff on the free leg is obviously then going to have to drop back down um, to sort of uh, get to that stretched out position to have the mass distributed over a bigger length. So, so I think really the, the, the key part that comes out of using that hang technique and, and maximizing through the takeoff is really just making sure, because the takeoff position for whether you're doing hang or hitch or stride jump, anything, that takeoff position is really the same for all of them. You're still trying to get to that as tall a position as possible. So the center of mass is as high as it can be when you leave the ground. You're trying to have it generate as much vertical velocity as possible during that takeoff and driving the arms and the knees up will help create a reaction force against the ground that potentially might affect that vertical velocity and give you more. Um, as far as, as affecting the horizontal velocity, it doesn't probably do much for that. It's more about the vertical because really during the ground contact, it's, it's, you're losing horizontal pretty much no matter what you do, but it's all about generating vertical or the optimal amount of vertical. Certainly in the long jump, it's not about all vertical because you don't want to go sky high and land two feet into the sand. Um, but it's a lot about creating vertical and then controlling the, um, the angular momentums uh, once you're up there because there is that forward rotation. And so, you know, the, the one thing to keep in mind too about the hang, it's a great technique, but it does require a huge amount of, of power, if you will, from the front side, from the abdominals and the hip flexors and stuff to come back out of that hang. Um, cause you're up in that big position and you want to stay in that stretched out position as long as you can, but eventually you have to snap everything forward to get into the heel shoot position. And right. it requires a lot of strength and power from those hip flexors and abdominals and stuff to come out of that hang and really effectively shoot, um, forward into that sort of jackknife or that pike position. So it's, it's a, it's a very good technique for controlling momentum, but it does require a lot of strength and power from the athlete to really get back out of that hang and into the effective landing position. And, and, and that can be a tough one for some athletes if they haven't either got that strength capacity or power to, to get out of it. 
And if they haven't quite got the technique, the worst part is if they let the legs drag down too long, it takes them too long to get them pulled through. They'll end up dragging the toes through the sand before they actually get to the heel shoot position. So it's a tricky one sometimes for timing, but it works very well for a lot of athletes that if they, especially if they are strong enough and powerful enough to sort of get back out of that stretched out position and actually get to the, to the heel shoot on the end. All right. Thanks yeah. very much. Yeah. I mean, like I say, I've had athletes who were hang jumpers, but predominantly most of my athletes have been stride jumpers, some hitch kickers, some hang, but mostly I've used stride jump just because I've found it's a good starting point to then find out what works. And some people hang works and some people hitch works for a lot of them. The stride is actually good enough. Like I said, uh, Pierre Landry, who was a, you know, a 720 long jumper, um, um uh, actually better than 720 i guess long jumper um basically did most of his career used stride jump and, and really used it quite effectively so um you know there are lots of ways to to master that angular momentum so find the one that kind of works well and for some of them that hang is definitely the one that works for some athletes yeah that's it's it's <clears throat> just something that came natural naturally to him yeah he's, he's only he's not 14 yet so yeah but some of them, it's just that they automatically go to that and it works well. Yeah. And then other athletes, um, you can try to coach them to do it and they just, it does not work well <laughs> yeah. for them, right? So yeah. it does come down as, as many things of finding the technique that works for the athlete rather than trying to force them into a technique. But uh, if, they, if, it, if they go to it naturally and it works for them, then that's probably the one that they're going <laughs> to, it's probably the one that's going to be the one for their career. Um, right. Yeah. I was just, I was just looking to see if there's a way to maximize yeah, but it's mostly about it, controlling but... things at that point. You're generating as much vertical as you can and then controlling everything else in, in how you come out of that takeoff position and into your flight. It's really just about controlling that angular momentum, however you're going to do it. Right. Excellent. Great question. Um, hey, thanks. Anybody else, uh, any else got uh, questions or comments or points of discussion? Or tired of <laughs> tired of hearing me talk? Let me turn my, I'm going to turn this back off and we can get back into like, uh, just seeing everybody. Oh, I hadn't even noticed there was some, oh, merci Carl. Um, and Yvonne. Um, yeah. So if there, if you have any other, uh, questions, I didn't really, um, get too much into triple jump. There is one little thing. If anybody's interested in triple jump on here, there's one little video. I think I have it pulled up here. Yes, I do. I am going to share this one and I'll just let it play and we can keep talking while it plays. So just let me do uh, the screen share again here. Um, the reason I like this uh, particular video is it shows uh, a sequence of, uh, from the what, 2012 uh, Olympic games. And it's a bunch of different triple jumpers kind of in slow motion. And the really interesting part about it is all the different arm techniques that they're using. Um, so we didn't even talk about it too much in triple jump. It's one of my favorite things to talk about in triple jump is arm technique. And so in triple jump, we'll talk about people using single arm technique or double arm technique, or the special case of what they call the arm and a half technique, um, which Victor Sanye have used for his very long and successful career. If anybody knows who he is, he's a four time Olympian in triple jump, three gold medals and a bronze in triple jump. That's a long career as a triple jumper. Anyway, um, I'm going to play this video here and just watch the multiple variations of arm technique that these athletes use, which I was what really I love about this video is seeing. So we have this first guy come in and he's going to do a pure double on the first takeoff, double on the second and double on the third. So that's what we call a double, double, double. I don't, that confuses people at Tim Hortons, but that's a double, double, double right there. Um, the next guy that comes in is going to use, I believe this one's a single double, double. Yeah. So there's a single and then he gets into the double and then he does a double. So he uses again, what we would call a single double, double, which is the technique I prefer in triple jump. But again, some athletes that I've coached have used different techniques. Um, this guy is going to come in and I think he's going to use an arm and a half. If I recall, oh no, he does a single. Oh yeah. He does the single, 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 I think. Yeah, he does a single, 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 which is kind of rare. You don't see that a lot in world-class triple jumpers. It is quite different to see. Um, and then we got this guy coming in. I think this might be the arm and a half guy, is it? We'll see. Yes, he's the arm and a half. So you see he doesn't kind of do a real full double arm. That left arm just sort of tucks into his side and then thrusts up. 
So he does the arm and a half and then a double double. So that's again, a little different variation. And uh, anyway, it's kind of cool just watching these different techniques at play and you can see the different, um, how it leads to some different uh, technique in the other aspects of their jumping. But mostly you see a lot of the second and third phases, most um, world-class triple jumpers will use double arms on the second and third phase. More of the variation comes in that first phase, whether they're doing singles or doubles or arm and a half. Um, but it's kind of fun to watch these world-class guys using. So there's another kind of what I would call an arm and a half, but he gets it into sort of a single and then a true double on the final phase. So kind of interesting to, uh, to watch those. Anyway, just wanted to share that because I thought it's a really, it's a really neat video of, of seeing those different techniques at play in triple jump. Um, any other questions or comments or, or anything that, that uh, I didn't cover or anything that you think I said that was wrong? Because <laughs> some of those were just my opinions. <laughs> Um, I have some science to back some of it up, but some of it is also just my experience with the athletes I've coached and, uh, and my experiences with that as to what I think works and doesn't work. But uh, most of it's backed up by science. It is sort of <laughs> it's sort of my background. All right. Well, not hearing any other questions or comments, I'm going to stop the share of the triple jump video, no matter how much I love it. And uh, I guess if there's no other um, questions or comments or anything, we'll shut her down for tonight. Um, and I will, uh, as I'm recording this, so I'll just remind you that I will be posting it up on my YouTube channel if you're uh, wanting to check it out later and rewatch it or anything. Um, and certainly if you have any questions, um, please, uh, please reach out, to get in touch with me. Uh, TeamAtlantic at yahoo.ca is my email. And, um, you know, feel free, you know, if you want to ask questions about what's covered in this, whatever, and reminder that we will be doing another one of these coming up in a few weeks, we're going to do uh, part three, which is going to be looking at throwing events, looking at the biomechanics of throwing events. So that one hopefully will be fun as well. Um, I see a few comments. They, thank you guys for, for taking part. I, I, this did go a bit longer than I, I meant for it to go, although it technically it is shorter than the sprints <laughs> one was that went for like two hours. Um, but yeah, um, certainly, uh, reach out and, uh, if you have questions or comments and hopefully join, uh, in a few weeks time when we do the one on uh, throwing and, uh, anyway, that's it for tonight. Thank you for joining and, uh, hopefully, uh, see you next time when we talk about throws.